go. Um, so really the architecture of the, you know, the ISR 4000s, like I said, the, the, there really is very, very little technical difference between an ASR 1000, between a, an ISR 4000, uh, and even a cloud services router. It's all the same iOS XC software. We all, we have the same control plane, certainly, and it's uh, just a different data plane implementation between the three, but it's the same software running on the data plane in, uh, in each case. Um, but the architecture for the, uh, for the 4000 specifically, like I said, pay as you grow is one of the key things that you'll hear lots about the, uh, the new ISR 4000. It's really giving you the capability to buy one level of performance, one level of features, of services, of applications, of virtualization uh, in a platform. And then over time, as the needs of your branch grow and change, your platform can grow with you um, without having to pay for everything right up front. Um, so that's you know, one of the, the key messages there, certainly. The services aware data plane, you know, everything built in there, the same data plane really in the CSR, the ASR 1000, and the, uh, the ISR there as well. Virtualized services, both on the platform itself and on the UCSE, of course. Same UCSE servers as the ISR G2, um, although in, unless you guys have heard about it recently, we just revamped the entire UCSE portfolio, um, basically moving from Sandy Bridge to Ivy Bridge CPU, and that's one of those examples of server technology moving around much faster than, uh, than router technology. So Intel keep coming out with new server CPUs, we have to revamp the UCSE series to really keep up with that, just like any other server vendor, really. Um, so we now have what we call the M2 variant. It's just an M2 and part of the, the product ID uh, of UCSE servers in there. Did the memory capacity change with that ref? Memory capacity did not change, although that is something that we're looking at, at changing on some of them. And that's still 12 gigs? 16 gigs on the single wide, 48, 48 on the double. Okay. We're looking at 96 as well. Going up to 96 on the double. We are today, or are we, we... Not sure it's ready to ship. Oh, it is ready to ship? Okay. I wasn't telling these guys anything that isn't shipping yet, man, but okay. I'm the product manager there. Um, and, and of course, four to 10 times faster at the same price as an ISR G2. Um, whenever we move from one generation to the next, it's, it's never a complete straight line. If you have this router, you must always upgrade to this one. It's always a very nebulous kind of decision. Um, and we tried to give you even more flexibility now with different form factors, 2RU, 1RU, desktop, uh, depending on where you are. And of course, with four to 10 times better performance, you know, it's, it's going to be a little, bit of a, uh, a little bit of more work to figure out which platform you move to from an ISR G2, uh, but that's okay because at the end of the day, you're probably getting a platform whose performance and whose form factor meets your needs better than, than what we were able to give you before. Okay. So this is the, uh, the performance report I, I told you about earlier in the performance curve. Um, this is actually a real performance graph from a Myricom report. Um, now, Myricom, of course, they are contracted. You do pay them for the report, uh, but they won't lie. Um, they, they do come in and they, you do have to actually prove whatever they put into a report or whatever you want them to put into a report. Uh, and basically what we did with the 4451 launch was we basically said, look, we want you guys to come in and write a report on this flat performance curve, basically, um, at one gig and two gig performance levels. And so if you go, the easiest way to find that, rather than giving you a link, is just go to Google and do Cisco 4451 Myricom or just Myricom 4451, it's, it's really easy to find that way. Um, and you see a nice flat performance curve across a, a huge number of, of feature combinations of, of test cases. Eventually, like I said earlier, you, know, you can turn on enough features, you can turn on AVC, NetFlow, you know, really heavy hitting features, and you will get a tapering off of that performance curve. It's gonna happen naturally. Um, but if you look at a software only platform or um, you know, something like an ISR G2, every feature that you turn on is gonna give you slightly lower performance. So, you know, that being said, it's a much, much more predictable platform uh, in the ISR 4000. We are upgrading uh, or updating this uh, report, by the way. In the next couple of months, we'll have the rest of the 4000 family uh, as part of this, but it's currently today, it only shows the 4451. Okay. I'm never happy when Lauren gives that kind of very worried look. Not you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that report is out there. Uh, feel free to take a look at that. It's been out for a little over a year now. Um, you know, it, it, it's very well known. So the actual I.O. design, uh, we tried to keep this fairly familiar for folks coming from the ISR world. Uh, the actual sheet metal is built off of a 2921-2951, um, but the, that's, you know, and, and then some of the modules have a, have a lot of similarity, but that's, you know, we, we added a lot of new capabilities outside of that. The first is a management interface. Uh, first time we've ever put it on a branch platform, uh, and it's really kind of a slam dunk. It's, it's an obvious thing for us to do because we have a separate control plane CPU and a separate data plane CPU. So it's really easy just to plug an Ethernet interface into that control plane CPU. It, it's 
next to free for us to do. Yeah. Is that isolated from the forwarding standpoint so that you cannot route yeah. through it, you cannot fast track like, it through it? Just like on the ASR 1000, same architecture, so it, it resides on its own VRF. Um, so it, you can't forward through it. You, you physically can't forward through it because um, there is no punt path in any of these routers. So um, there is no forwarding through the, uh, through the management interface. It does, we have had some, some customers interested in moving to a management interface on just a, uh, you know, a commodity you know, DSL or cable connection to, as sort of an emergency management for their branch rather than you know, using a, an analog dial-up modem to connect to an aux port. Um, copying a, a large iOS XE file over a modem is not something I would ever, ever, ever want to do. But doing it over, uh, you know, a 10 meg cable modem connection is something that, you know, wouldn't be that, that big of a deal. Front panel interfaces, of course, we always give you some interfaces for free on the ISRs. Uh, and the number of interfaces varies with platform. Higher in the portfolio, more. Lower in the portfolio, less. At the 4451, you get four. Uh, and whenever possible, we try to give you dual PHY interfaces, meaning that they're either RJ45 or SFP. Not both at the same time, but either or. So if you need a fiber connection to a switch, you can do that. If you need a copper connection, it's there for free, basically. The one thing that's unique is on the 4400 series, uh, two of these interfaces actually support PoE+. Now, the reason that we did that um, was basically so that we could, in the future, develop a, uh, an external 4G LTE modem. Um, the problem that we run into, especially at the high end of our portfolio, the larger branches, is that you're probably putting the router in a closet in a basement somewhere with, with really terrible wireless WAN coverage. So what you have to do is you have to run RG6 coax cable up to a roof, up to a window somewhere, and RG6 is not easy to run, it's very expensive, but most buildings with structured dry wiring already have Cat5. So that same basement location, you can just run a Cat5 patch from the router up to whatever location you need to put this, this radio, uh, power it over Ethernet, configure it over Ethernet, and get all of the data and everything through that, that one front panel port. Uh, so that's why those two, those two interfaces have uh, uh, power over Ethernet there. I.O. modules, two different main module types that we have here, network interface modules, which you might, have, you might remember from the old Cisco 4000 days, uh, same name anyway. Uh, and then twice that size are the, uh, the service modules, uh, the SM modules. Um, and uh, uh, those are basically the two major module types we have. We also have an internal module that you can't really see. Actually, you guys can see because it's under the, uh, the clear cover there, uh, called the internal services card. Um, that's used today as one of the places where you can put PVDMs, put DSP uh, resources. Um, and then in the future, we may have uh, available for additional cards in there as well. Okay, internal architecture. So this is where the 4400 and the 4300 differ very, very slightly, but this is not something that's actually visible to the end user. It's something that 99% of customers aren't going to care about. But because they told me you guys were technical, I put these slides in here. So the 4400 series, uh, that guy right there, you see two great big heat sinks, which is what everybody likes to see, is more heat sinks, right? So you see two heat sinks, and that's because we use a physically separate data plane and a physically separate control plane. Now the control plane is a four core x86, uh, control plane CPU, but we just need one of those cores to actually run our control plane protocols, iOS, classic iOS here. Uh, that leaves us three cores left over for Linux machines, Linux virtual machines, KVM or LXC containers. The first machine that we have uh, today is actually WAS. We have full featured WAS. We call it ISR WAS, just the name, uh, but it's the exact same capability, the same software really as WAS running on a virtual machine, vWAS, as WAS running on an appliance. Same software, same capabilities, just running inside of the other uh, router itself, okay? Then the data plane itself actually responsible for all forwarding of packets. Multi-gigabit fabric, something we had in the ISR G2 is basically a layer two switch inside of the router itself. Now the reason we have a layer two switch connecting all of our actual modules here is because any traffic that is taking place in the branch and staying local to the branch, staying on the same VLAN, we wanna keep that off of the expensive data plane, the, uh, the place where you're providing all of your really deep feature processing within the system. So the use case for this is if you have a UCSE server sitting inside of your router, sitting inside of your branch, giving you a whole bunch of virtual machines uh, you know, within the branch, maybe one of them is a video surveillance VM that's recording all of your video feeds and you have a bunch of cameras plugged into an ethernet switch in the same router, it makes a lot of sense for those cameras or those users accessing vir virtual machines to go through the multi-gigabit fabric at layer two rather than uh, to access that, that UCSE virtual machine rather than going all the way up to the data plane to get forwarded right back down into the same box. So that's why we have the multi-gigabit fabric. Same story on the ISR G2s. We just brought it forward to the, uh, to the ISR 4000s. Okay. Data planes are that your ASICs?
No, no. So in the ASR 1000, they are a, a Cisco ASIC, and that's one of the that's one of the differences between an ASR 1000 and uh, an ISR for th an ISR. Is um, in an ASR 1000, we have a, an ASIC called the Quantum Flow Processor, which is Cisco designed, Cisco developed, actually developed in RTP as well. Um, and the QFP under the hood is really an array of individual CPU cores with a whole bunch of of sexy interconnects and stuff done uh, to that. But in, at the end of the day, it's a bunch of CPU cores. What we're actually doing here is actually taking an off-the-shelf CPU complex, not from Cisco, but we're running the same software on that array that we run on the QFP. What that means is that our costs are significantly lower than a customized ASIC, but it also means our performance is much lower. But we only need two gigs of forwarding. We don't need 160 gigs. So it's a reasonable trade-off for a branch router that is a much, much less expensive proposition than an ASR 1000. And that's one of the ways, that's one of the differences, but from an end user perspective, they don't even see the difference. Uh, the configuration commands still show QFP. It's still managed and configured and, and shown just like, a, uh, uh, just like an ASR 1000. Okay. CSR 1000, by the way, is exactly the same thing. They just use multiple CPU threads instead of an ASIC or multi-core CPU. Okay. Packet flow, like I said, is uh, pretty straightforward. The control plane programs the data plane like most split control data plane uh, platforms. Uh, and then the control plane is, is pretty much done. There is no punt path through the control plane, which is different than, than some platforms. Um, and then packet forwarding, the data plane is responsible for 100% of packet processing through the system, uh, whether it's coming from front panel gigies or uh, to the SMs or to the network interface modules. Everything goes through the data plane and then out through the multi-gigabit fabric, which connects our, uh, our interface modules, except for traffic that stays local to the same VLAN, local to the same uh, branch. Uh, all of that traffic can stay on the multi-gigabit fabric, the MGF, without having to go through the data plane itself. This slide took me four hours on a Friday night, so I show it in every single presentation. <laughs> okay, so. You'd be amazed how hard it is to get those little dots to follow each other. And this means that if you have a bug in SAS switching path, there is no way to work around that bug. If you have a bug in the SAS switching path... Previously, we turned off SAS switching. We were in process switching, but at least it worked. Um, even on the ISRG2, that's not really an option. Um, you know, in, in modern modern classic iOS, there really is no switching path outside of Ceph. Um, yeah, I, I don't think you can even, I think even if you turn off Ceph in a modern iOS router, it's still doing Ceph under the hood. Um, I, I don't think that command actually really does anything anymore. Well, no, 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 I mean, because, because honestly, I mean, Ceph switching is, is sort of the same forwarding paradigm you know, for the system. There is no separate of the code. And the Ceph code path, honestly, has been in place you know, mostly untouched for a significant number of years. Um, so if you've got a, a bug in Ceph, it's just like having a critical bug, you know, in the system itself. Hopefully that's something that we'll find 100% of the time, you know, very, very early in the test stages of a software release. Um, but yeah, that, that is something that you can't really work around a Ceph bug, I guess. Yeah. Um, the slightly different architecture in the 4300 series, and I just put this up here for completion. Uh, the 4331 there, uh, you'll notice only has one heat sink, um, and that's because we're using a, uh, a single multi-core Intel x86 chip, a Gladden chip here, uh, basically, to uh, uh, basically give you eight CPU cores. Four of those are data plane, four of those at maximum performance levels uh, for data plane, and three of those for services and one for control. Other than that, software is the same, architecture packet flow, exactly the same. All right, I'm running a little bit behind time, so I'll uh, um, just kind of speed up a little bit. So um, services and virtual machines, virtual containers. Now, this is not something that is unique to the ISR 4000s. I mentioned that we have it on the ISR 4K um, as well. We also have it on the Nexus platforms as well. They're in the process of, of, of integrating this, and we do have some capabilities on the Nexus platforms. Um, we also have it on the ASR 1000, although we don't really, we, we did have one application that used to use uh, this, it was actually a data center application. I can't even remember the name of it, um, but we never really published that as a KVM container, uh, just like Wireshark on the, on the CAT 4K. Um, this architecture is in a lot of different Cisco platforms. If you do a search for Cisco service container, uh, you'll find several YouTube videos, several TechWise TV videos, some blog posts, some white papers. Um, most of them have my name on them. Um, so, you know, it's out there and, and this technology is, is more pervasive than just uh, the ISR 4000s. We do have, like I said, WAS. Uh, that was actually introduced when we launched the 4451. Uh, and we'll very soon, soon be shipping uh, EnergyWise uh, there as well, Cisco Julex uh, on, a, uh, on a separate container. 
There are some storage options inside of the system. We don't include storage for services by default, uh, simply because it doesn't make sense to put that cost on every single person if they're not going to do services, but we have some options for you. Um, the first is a, uh, an SSD carrier, which I think I have in that guy right there in the middle NIMS slot, um, that can take one or two SSD drives. Um, we also have a hard drive variant of that uh, that is ready. We're just not shipping it yet because Cisco WAS uh, only supports SSDs for speed. They, uh, they wanted to, to go with SSDs, so um, as soon as we have a, a service that supports it, we're, we're ready to ship the hard drive variant. We also, on the 4300s, if you don't want to burn a NIM slot, which on something like a 4321, you only have two of them, uh, we have an internal uh, eSATA board, an internal 200 gig uh, eSATA card. And I don't think that I have one in there. Actually, I might. Um, but we do have a, a socket there for just basically an, an, an mSATA internal card. So lots of storage options there that aren't there you know, by default. Uh, modules, I'll just really quickly go through this unless you guys have specific questions. Um, when we talk about module compatibility and um, what we call investment protection of moving from one generation to the next, it's something that we generally take very, very seriously on the ISRs. If you look at uh, all the way from the 2600s that I showed you on that earlier slide, all the way up to the ISR G2s, we supported WAN interface cards. So the same WIC technology, WICs, HWICs, high-speed WICs, enhanced high-speed WAN interface cards, all throughout the entire portfolio there um, you know, were supported from one generation to the next. The reality was that it, it became a time for us to basically pull a Band-Aid off quickly uh, rather than slowly. WICs uh, have been around since the 2600 days, and they use a serial interconnect technology, very proprietary technology, uh, making it really difficult for us to build new HWICs and WICs and EHWICs. Um, and so we were looking at, you know, we're moving to these new iOS XE platforms, what technology are we going to go to for our WAN interface cards? Um, and that's where the NIMS came from. Um, they're basically all PCI and Ethernet on the back end, just like our service modules, by the way. Um, so the reality is, while we have a lot of these newer enhanced SMs that are backwards compatible to the ISRG 2s uh, the reality is that most ISRG2 modules don't carry forward. And this is what I, what I mean when I say that we're ripping the Band-Aid off all at once. Um, most customers, this isn't really an issue as long as we have a module option for what they need going forward. You know, it's, that's, that's a complete option there. Downside is you can't carry forward any of your EHWICs, your HWICs, your WICs. But for some of your modules, certainly the ones that we've been introducing in the last year or so, year to 18 months, uh, in the SM form factor, a lot of those are going to work in both the ISRG2 and uh, the 4K. So there is technically some investment protection there, um, but it's not as great as, as it would have been in years past. In terms of interface breadth, um, and like I said earlier, with the movement towards Ethernet WAN handoffs, this is becoming um, you know, certainly still a very, very strong point. We still sell more T1 interfaces than just about any other interface, believe it or not, um, around the world. Um, but we are still seeing huge movements into to Ethernet WAN. Um, that being said, we do have to have options for basically every popular WAN interface technology that's out there. And that's really one of the reasons we launched the 4451 a year ahead of the rest of the family is that we can build up that, uh, that, that, uh, all of these interface types. Um, so today we've got uh, really the, the vast majority of interfaces covered. Uh, within the next six months, I think we're going to have a complete coverage on this map. Okay. Specific modules, of course, uh, some of our popular modules. Um, we have a new Ether switch module, uh, which is basically a catalyst switch on a blade. Um, it's the same thing that we've been doing all the way since the ISR G1s. Uh, it's just that with each generation, we basically map up our technology, our blade technology, with the Catalyst uh, family. And the latest version of this works in both an ISR G2 and an ISR 4K uh, and picks up some features from the Catalyst family that we missed, uh, we just didn't have in time uh, when we built the last module. Uh, things like TrustSec and MaxSec uh, and PoE Plus, believe it or not, we didn't have on our previous switch modules. So these are all uh, 16, 24, and 48 port uh, Ethernet switch modules. They're basically a Catalyst switch on a blade uh, inside of your router. Okay. Uh, as far as routed interfaces go, we do have a couple of different options there for you. First off, we have a six port uh, giggy routed port module, which gives you six ports of uh, dual FI connectivity, either RJ45 or SFP, just like the front panel ports. Um, so that means that if you need to connect physically routed ports uh, to your system, you can get a lot of physical routed ports you know, inside of uh, a system. You can get up to 16 uh, physical routed ports in, in a 4451, for example. We also have another variant of that, and that is a 4x1 gig module, same concept as the 6 module. And then you can switch that module over with just a software command to a 1x10 gig interface. 
Uh, so you can't use both the 10 gig interface and the four one gig interfaces at the same time. Uh, the backplane interconnect is only 10 gigs, so we don't want to oversubscribe that for routed interfaces. Um, so you can start out with we can start out with four one gig interfaces and then move to a to a 10 gig interface there. Okay. As far as voice modules go, we we've really tried to to kick this into high gear, basically giving you all of the, the, the T1, the FXO, the FXS ports, uh, the PVDM capabilities, the same DSP capabilities that you expect on a G1 and an ISR uh, and an ISR G2. Uh, we also have a carrier card that gives you even better voice density if you're doing voice aggregation. Um, some specifics for the, uh, for the DSP resources. We changed the way that we do DSPs on the uh, uh, ISR4K a little bit, um, and, uh, and it's, it's actually Kind of cool the way, that, the way that we did that. So we basically, you can put DSPs in two different locations on an ISR 4000. They can either be on the motherboard itself, and you can see that a little square daughter card with a heat sink that you guys see on both of these is actually a DSP. It's a PVDM4. Uh, the DSP under the hood is exactly the same as on a PVDM3. We just changed the form factor uh, in this. And by changing that form factor, that meant that we could put a DSP on, uh, on the network interface module as well. Uh, so you can also put DSPs on the, uh, on the NIM card itself. And there's actually a NIM card uh, in that router, but it just doesn't have a DSP on it. Okay, the reason... So being able to put those in the, the network module, uh, you, can, oh, you can get past the limitations of the board, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and basically what you're doing is you're using your module DSP for transcoding on that module itself, okay. uh, and the, the DSP resources on the motherboard, then you only need those for cube or for uh, any kind of conferencing on the board. So basically, when you add a new voice card uh, to the system, you can buy that bundled with the DSP, so you don't have to pre-populate DSPs in the system. Yeah, that's the way we did that. Yeah. Uh, SM carrier card, so we also have an SM carrier card. One of the, the feedback that we got from the 4451 is that we need more voice density in a few uh, instances. And that's why in platforms with an SM slot, we do have a carrier that allows you to put one network interface module card uh, in an SM slot. It's a little bit non-intuitive. It looks like it could take two network interface modules, but it only takes one either single wide or double wide. There's some real technical reasons for that behind the scenes on the back plane. Uh, of the system in the logical way that we address modules in the system, but at the end of the day, it really winds out that you basically get one single wide or one double wide NIM in an SM form factor, in an SM slot, okay? As far as the UCSE series, how many of you guys are familiar with the UCSE? Aware of it? So at a really high level, a UCSE is a bare metal uh, UCS on a blade inside of an ISR G2 or 4000. Um, so it uses the same lights out management, it uses the same management tools as a UCS server in the branch. Think of it as a really lightweight UCS C series uh, for chassis server, just on a blade, uh, just on a single blade. It comes in two form factors. Uh, we previously had the M1 variant, which was uh, Intel Sandy Bridge CPUs. We've just basically revamped that to Ivy Bridge, as I mentioned. Uh, the single wide, most flexibility, basically any platform that has an SM slot, a single wide SM slot, can take a single wide. There's one there in the, the 4331. Uh, and that can have up to two drives, 16 gigs of, uh, of DRAM, four core or now, uh, yeah, four core CPU there with, with lights out management there as well. Um, full KVM support, the same dongle used on a UCS server. So for folks that are familiar with UCSs physically and from a management tools perspective, it's gonna look very familiar. Like I said, it's a bare metal server, so you can put any software you want to on it. Um, we're on the approved and qualified vendor list for just about every uh, desktop and hypervisor uh, operating system except for OS X. It was a joke. Via service profiles as well? Um, that is something that you can do either today or in the next few months because you can use service profiles with UCS Manager and support for UCS Manager is either today or in the next release. Do you know off the top of your head? Yeah, it's November. It's, it's November. Support with the UCS director. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's not the Sorry, uh, UCS director, yeah. Yeah. So next month the answer is yes. That's why I didn't want to say absolutely yes because I don't think it's true today, but next month. The double wide form factor is the one that is super interesting, I think. Um, if you've got a double wide slot and you can physically uh, consume that, you can go up to three drives there. So you can do RAID 0, 1, or 5, uh, or RAID 0 or 1 with a spare, with a hot spare drive. Uh, up to 48 gigs today. Of, uh, of DRAM there, uh, uh, up to an eight core CPU as well. Okay. 
The primary network connectivity for these guys is actually through the mid plane of the system. We do give you some front panel ports, of course, for, for Ethernet there. But other than that, from a server standpoint, these look just like a regular server, um, whether you're installing VMware, Windows, you know, what have you. Um, it, it looks just like a, a, a typical server. Okay. And a whole range of, uh, of UCS is available all the way from two core to four core, six core, and eight core uh, in, uh, in double wide form factor there. But these are all, all public, mo not public modules. There's nothing really new to them for the ISR 4000s other than the fact that, um, peace to you too, other than the fact that, it's okay, Lauren, I'm done. This is the last slide. Um, other than the fact that, um, that they are supported across the ISR 4000 family. Okay, so any last questions, any, any last things you wanna think about on the, the ISR 4000? Anything you wanna know about the ISRs in general? Do they have a REST API? Uh, REST API, oh, so, so REST API, uh, you say that jokingly, but if you want a serious answer. Um, so a REST API is something that we developed for the CSR, uh, for the CSR 1000. Um, that REST API is actually written in a service container uh, on the CSR 1000. And we're currently looking at supporting that on an ASR 1000. No reason it won't work. Um, it's just testing it basically for a couple of customers that have requested it. And there's absolutely no reason it wouldn't work on an ISR 4000. Uh, so, so I can say REST API as it's needed. If it's needed, we'll, you know, and, and that is something we do plan on doing. If certainly if we get a big customer saying, I need a REST API today, we could test it and push it out the door. But it's the same REST, it's the same architecture as a CSR, so that same REST API application would work on an ASR or on an ISR 4K. Yep. So some more links here just so that they get recorded. Um, just for you guys, if you want more information, everything's a Go link, so Go IWAN, Go ISR 4000, which will be live tomorrow, um, Go UCSE. And then the last one here, last but not least, I always like to plug this guy. This is kind of, I call it an, Lauren has to close her ears here. This is an underground YouTube channel that is just uh, ISR and ASR and CSR TMEs. Uh, so we just do quick and dirty videos for stuff that we think is interesting or folks that, that ask us for something. Um, and we post the videos to uh, just basically CSCO routing. You'd be surprised how many YouTube channels already have the word Cisco in them. So CSCO routing is the closest I could get. <laughs>